my name is Robin and I help direct events here at The Strand. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we will be doing a discussion and then the signing will be at the conclusion of the event, um, just so you all know. Uh, so, okay, welcome to the art department. Uh, for a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, The Strand is not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books, hosts nearly 400 events a year, and is opening a second location this spring on the Upper West Side at 81st and Columbus. In large part, this is thanks to all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Sarah J. Jackson, Moya Bailey, and Brooke Foucault-Wells in celebration of their new book, Hashtag Activism. The book explores how hashtags like Me Too, Survivor Privilege, and Why I Stayed have challenged the conventional understanding of gendered violence, how hashtags Fast-Tailed Girls, You OK Sis, and say her name examine voices and narratives of transgender women and how hashtag girls like us have helped grow uh, a network of transgender women I'm, I'm sorry um, and then as well as hashtag black lives matter has helped pave the way for a new civil rights movement Sarah J Jackson is a presidential associate professor in the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania Moya Bailey is assistant professor in the Department of Cultures Studies and Global Studies at Northeastern University and Brooke Foucault Wells is a associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Northeastern University. Please join me in welcoming them to the Strand. Thank you. Yes. Test. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can hear it's on. Um, so here's what we thought we would do. First, thank you all for being here. Um, we appreciate it we know that everyone's trying to stay healthy and it's raining and it's super tuesday and we were like oh the timing of this is not great uh, <laughs> but thank you for being here um we are going to do just a couple short readings um i'm gonna read a little bit um from the book we're gonna discuss Moya's is gonna read a little bit from the book we're gonna discuss we're all three gonna share some of um kind of our favorite questions and stories um from working on this project and we're we'll make sure to leave a lot of time for questions because we do want to have a discussion with you all um and so with that i'm going to jump right in i am going to start um i never know how familiar people are with what twitter is and what hashtags are so i am bear with me be patient while i give a little like briefing on that and then i'll jump into some other stuff In the 21st century, the proliferation of social media has enabled the widespread study of and speculation about the impact of digital technologies on politics, activism, and social change. Key among these debates is the role of social media in shaping the contemporary public sphere and by proxy our democracy. Since the 2011 Arab Spring and the upwelling of Occupy movements across the globe, social networks have influenced how both those on the margins and those at the center engage in socio-political debate and meaning making. Building on the success of the activist tool Text Mob, Twitter was launched in 2006 as a microblogging platform that allowed users only 140 character communications at a time. Now it's 280, but at the time and up until um, late 2017, it was only 140. By 2015, the site boasted more than 300 million active users. These users' tweets created a continuous live deluge of information. So you know if you ever tried to join Twitter but didn't quite get it, it was probably because you were overwhelmed by that deluge of information. Following certain users, creating lists of users, and using third-party apps are among the tactics available to help manage the flow of tweets. Hashtags which are a discursive and user-generated tool, have become the default method to designate collective thoughts, ideas, arguments, and experiences that might otherwise stand alone or be quickly subsumed within the fast-paced culture of Twitter. Hashtags make sense of groups of tweets by creating a searchable shortcut that can link people and ideas together. 
So throughout the book, then, we use the term hashtag activism to refer to the strategic ways that groups and their allies on Twitter employ this shortcut to make political contentions about identity politics that advocate for social change, identity redefinition, and political inclusion. So I'm going to segue and just read you a little bit from um, our chapter titled From Ferguson to Falcon Heights. Um, it's a chapter that's looking at um, what most people would think of as the Black Lives Matter network. Um, but we find that this network contains a lot of hashtags besides the hashtag Black Lives Matter. Often those hashtags are uh, geographic locators um, like Ferguson and Falcon Heights. And often they're people's names. Um, and we'll talk little bit more about that um, after I read this section. <clears throat> the story of what happened in Ferguson began to circulate on Twitter, first through personal accounts from Michael Brown's neighbors, whose tweets set the stage for how the larger activist narrative around the events of August 9th would evolve. The story was pushed along and the network enlarged by members of the local and national community, including local alderman Antonio French, who was arrested while participating in protests and tweeted about it, Rapper Tef Poe, who arrived to participate as well and tweeted about it. And MSNBC's Goldie Taylor, a St. Louis native, who also tweeted about it. Jonetta Elsie and D. Ray McKesson, who credit the events of Ferguson and their tweets with turning them from concerned young citizens into activists, were also on the scene. Together, these Twitter users helped spread the story to a range of networks, docu documented on-the-ground efforts, and buoyed calls for aid from the general public as justice continued to be waylaid. Soon, increasing online attention to the events in Ferguson, and particularly the conflicts that developed around unarmed protesters, journalists, and police, became, became unignorable even in the most mainstream of faces, spaces. Hashtag Ferguson also became more than a geographic descriptor of the town where Michael Brown was killed. It became a stand-in for any town USA. Black Lives Matter activists across the country and the world were soon chanting, Ferguson is everywhere in demands for justice in the extrajudicial abuse and killing of black people. The diverse conversations in and use of the hashtag mirror what we have found in other parts of our book through intersectional, has intersectional hashtags created by black feminists and the other hashtags that emerged after Ferguson. Ordinary people using hashtag Ferguson and hashtag Black Lives Matter contributed issue framing, prescriptions, and analysis in the network that extended far beyond the digital realm to penetrate national and international discourse. So this was um, really interesting in this book. What we did is we really tried to trace some of these more famous hashtags that you've heard of, like Black Lives Matter and like Me Too, um, to... Uh, the other hashtags that existed in the networks, the stories that were told around them, and the hashtags maybe that became, came before or after in, in helping to popularize these hashtags. Um, and so one thing I would love Moya and, and Brooke to reflect on with me is just maybe some of, particularly in thinking about this Black Lives Matter network and racial justice um, activism on Twitter, what some of the more um, interesting findings in the research that we did were. Uh, so for me, this is one of the um, the more poignant findings in the book. Uh, so we looked, I think we started this one with Trayvon Martin. Um, and Trayvon Martin, um, that the name Trayvon Martin, um, was obviously originally associated with his murder. It was used quite a bit during the trial of George Zimmerman, um, the man who killed him. Um, and then it continued to be used um, a, as a sort of uh, symbol of a broader set of injustices. And where this really became clear for me um, in a kind of surprising way is when Trayvon Martin's name started getting attached to other people's names. So we would see these tweets uh, where, we would, where we would have hashtag Trayvon Martin, hashtag Mike Brown, hashtag Trayvon Martin, hashtag Eric Garner. And then really powerfully, we'd started to see hashtag Trayvon Martin, hashtag Oscar Grant, a man who was killed before Twitter even existed, um, hashtag Trayvon Martin, hashtag Emmett Till, right? And so here we see people using hashtags as a way to tell stories about a pattern of injustice that's difficult to ignore, right? So I can speak as a white American, uh, that one of the things white Americans are guilty of doing is kind of explaining away each individual case, 
right? So it's easy to find a reason uh, why any individual incident happens. And yet when we kind of discursively draw, connect the dots between all of these cases and connect them over decades, uh, even up to centuries, then it becomes hard to ignore the pattern. Right, and so this for me was really powerful. I would get entire tweets of just hashtag name, hashtag name, hashtag name. And I think related to that, I was really struck by the, not just the hashtag name, but the hashtag place, and how people were able to use hashtag place to open up a different kind of conversation than, wh than what was happening in uh, mainstream media. So one of the things we looked at is the difference between hashtag Baltimore riots versus hashtag Baltimore uprising. And so seeing the difference in how people were using those two hashtags. So this is in the context of Freddie Gray's death in Baltimore Absolute. and the protest afterwards. Absolutely. And that it created an opportunity to really contextualize that event in a different way. So if you call it an uprising, you're talking about this group of people who have been frustrated, upset for a long time, but to call it a riot is to dismiss all of the injustices that people had been suffering during that time period. So the way that the activist community framed these events was really important. And I think that's one of the beauties of Twitter is that people are able to use hashtags to frame the narrative in a new way. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that we were compelled to write this book. Both of those are great examples of the argument that we make in it, which is essentially not, of course, that um, Twitter is by any means um, designed to be used for justice. In fact, Twitter as a corporation, you know, we could write another <laughs> book full of critiques um, of it, but that, you know, ordinary people use this tool essentially that wasn't made for them um, to make these really compelling rhetorical arguments with just a couple words, right? So that when you attach Trayvon Martin's name as a hashtag to a tweet about something that's not directly related to um, his death, there's an argument being there, made there that people understand. And, and when the activists start using, you know, Baltimore riots, and then there's this moment we see in the network where they're like, mm, you know, the way people are using this is actually not useful for the political argument we're making. And they switch one word in the hashtag, then suddenly you see very clearly a different political argument being made. Um, so that was, I think, you know, one of the impetuses of, of the project. Yeah. And building on that, uh, one of the things that brought us together was our individual and then collective work on different hashtags. So Sarah and Brooke were working on the hashtag MyNYPD and how everyday folks reappropriated that hashtag, took it over, and used it to talk about all of the ways that the NYPD had been terrible <laughs> and violent to everyday citizens. Yeah. For those who don't know the context, um, this was, um, I want to say early 2014, oh. the New York City Police Department, and, and it's in, in retrospect now, people are like, how did they not know? But you have to remember that Twitter was still new to a lot of people, you know, at various stages of, of this research. And so the New York City Police Department had a public relations campaign where some public relations, you know, advisors told them, hey, um, share pictures and stories like with the N NYPD, with the hashtag my NYPD. And they even provided in the tweet the type of picture they would like to see, which of course was like two of the, you know, horse mounted um, in Times Square with like a tourist with an NYPD hat on or I Love New York hat on or something. And everyone's smiling. What could possibly go wrong, right? And of course you, could, you cannot guess, you know, what happened. Um, in retrospect, people always say, how did they not know? But they had no idea that that would happen, that instead millions of people, not just ordinary folk who are New Yorkers, including Jeannie Lauren, who was one of the influencers in that network who wrote the wrote a great contribution for us, so much so that we decided to make it the foreword of the book. Um, but people all over the world were then using this hashtag MyNYPD to talk about state violence and police brutality, even when they weren't specifically talking about the NYPD, right? It became this discursive shortcut online that you could follow and, and have this information. And then you were working on another project at the yes. same time. So as they were working on that, I was working on hashtag girls like us created by Janet Mock. 
And so I was really interested in how she had started to use this hashtag to create a network for trans women online. And so she created the hashtag just as a way to talk about trans activism, but then it really opened up to being a space where people were sharing all kinds of experiences and relationship building that was able to occur on there. So um, I'm going to read just a little bit from that chapter, which is chapter three, and talk about the way that not only did girls like us help build community, it also was used to create change. So hashtag girls like us tweets that focus on advocating for trans issues and rights do so by elevating the voices and history of trans women and sharing facts and information about trans experiences with injustice. These tweets are educational, a call to action, or both. For example, Trans March, a San Francisco organization that works to, quote, inspire all transgender nonconforming people to realize a world where we are safe, loved, and empowered, regularly tweets educational and biographical information about trans activists and figures like Marsha P. Johnson, Jazzy Collins, Billy Cooper, and Chelsea Manning. Tweets in this category also work to connect issues of trans liberation to intersectional concerns of poverty, racism, and sexism. For example, Janet Mock connected the case of C.C. McDonald to that of Trayvon Martin, whose case we consider in the next chapter. By using the hashtag justice for Trayvon alongside hashtag girls like us and free CC, Mock illustrates the connection between anti-black violence and trans identities, often left out of conversations about racial profiling. At the same time, Mock makes the issues of anti-black violence too often excluded from the mainstream LGBT movement central to her brand of trans advocacy. So what I really liked about what Janet was doing here was like connecting the way that racial justice and gender justice come together. And it was kind of a natural connection for her, seeing how these two movements were moving together to create a conversation that other people weren't having. And so I'm curious, how you all see that in kind of our other chapters, the way we've connected racial justice and gender justice across, across the text. Yeah. Uh, so for me, this is um, a, a great example of how um, doing activism on Twitter is a little different than doing activism in the offline world. Um, so we see lots and lots of examples like this where folks are kind of building bridges between movements or between sort of subgroups within movements and they do it right inside this short little tweet, right? And that, that um, allows people to kind of travel across the different movements um, at different points in time. And now some people are very good at kind of maintaining multiple activism um, priorities all at once, but most people sort of have to pick a lane and stick with it. Uh, but when folks do this sort of thing where they connect Trayvon Martin to girls like us, um, they're allowing visibility back and forth so folks can be in their lane, right? And they can follow the hashtags that they prioritize, they can tweet about the issues that they care about most, and they can keep up with all these other issues. And they, they start to see here um, kind of coalitions and commonalities. And we saw this again and again, right? So where the same types of people, and even in many cases, literally the same people, uh, would participate in multiple hashtags, sometimes as sort of core members or core activists on an issue, and other times as more peripheral members, uh, folks who just did retweeting, um, folks who did amplification. And it turns out that in order for these things to trend and for them to get picked up in the mainstream media, you need both, right? So you need the kind of core of committed activists shaping the message and really telling the stories, and then you need millions of other people on the periphery who are just spreading the message, amplifying it, and making something thing um, that the media wants to pick up on. Yeah, um, I mean, drawing off of that, I think there's two really interesting things that we write about and that we argue for in this book. So you'll often hear us 
talk about the people using these hashtags and creating these networks as activists and that's us calling them activists like most of these people are actually just ordinary people who like if you stop them on the street and you were like are they are you an activist they'd be like no, I'm a paralegal or what, you know, whatever their job is. Right. Um, but they're contributing. Right. So the example of the girls like us network, which is, you know, the hashtags created by Janet Mock, as Moya said, to really sort of empower and create community. Right. For trans women online. And it really is ordinary folks. Right. I mean, when Janet creates the hashtag, you all know who Janet Mock is now. She's a celebrity. But when she creates the hashtag in 2012, she's much less well known and most of the people using the hashtag are just ordinary trans women who are like I have to go home to Thanksgiving and I have these like transphobic you know family members how do I handle it or like I'm going for a job interview like how do I dress you know given you know my transness or I'm going you know oh hey Jeannie there's Jeannie who wrote the forward to the book I just saw her um she snuck in um and so you know these are really ordinary people and not to call Jeannie ordinary, but, you know, she is a great she's a great example of that. You know, um, we we asked Jeannie to write um, us a little excerpt for for the chapter where we talk about the, the Trayvon Martin case, because Jeannie successfully started an online campaign that had um, the the book contract that juror B37, who was on the Zimmerman jury, already had signed within, you know, like an hour of, of the decision. And, you know, Jeannie was she writes in the in the forward of the book you can read her story and I won't tell it for her but she essentially was working like a night job and she was bored and she was on Twitter all the time right and she got involved in these networks and these conversations um far way before you know the Trayvon case happens but then she uses her connections and you know people retweeting her to really have this real effect right later um but back to your question about you know the the connection about why did we write a book about racial justice and gender justice hashtags um because trust me we did have people say like we'll just focus on one thing and we we're like hey have you heard of intersectionality um we have uh but part of it is because the data made us do this because when you actually look at the data um and this is um you know we had to use you know i'm not going to get into methods but there's millions and 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 millions of tweets, right? Um, and you have to use network analysis and all these other things to figure out, okay, where does the hashtag start? Who's being most retweeted? Whose stories are being told? And one of the things we found, and I think um, our familiarity with Me Too is a great example of this, is that before there's a hashtag like Me Too that really becomes sort of ubiquitous, there's all these other, again, ordinary folks who are telling stories, perhaps about gendered violence, and this is what we find, who cross over across the gender justice, as as Brooke said, and the racial justice hashtag network. So one of the things we, we talk about in our chapter where we discuss Me Too is that what we found was there were these influential hashtags that trended in the years before Me Too. And you may not have heard of them because they weren't as influential as me too but those hashtags and the networks built around those hashtags ended up including the same people that then contribute to the trending of me two years later and those hashtags include things um like why i stayed which was a hashtag created by bev golden to talk about why women who are in um, partnerships where domestic invi- violence is involved don't leave um after some victim blaming you know happened in the news and hashtags like um Survivor Privilege, which um, Wagatwi Wanjuki, who's an anti-rape activist and, and wrote a contribution for us in that chapter, um, she started um, after um, this columnist at the Washington Post wrote a piece saying that um, women who claim that they're raped in college actually benefit from some kind of privilege, from some sort of, sort of you know, social status for saying so, right? And so she started this hashtag Survivor Privilege where she tweeted things about sort of the lifelong, you know, consequences of having been assaulted in college, right? Um, And um, there, you know, there's, there's many others like this that we look at in the book. And what we find is people like Bev, people like Jeannie, people like Wagatway, right? Um, They're using these hashtags um, in the years before Me Too, in the years before Black Lives, the hashtag Black Lives Matter. 
And that then when these bigger hashtags blow up and we actually look at the data, it's often these same people who started these hashtags that maybe you didn't hear of who are central in circulating these hashtags that you did hear of, right? And often, in almost all cases, not all, but almost you know, all cases, these are black women. Um, and they are very influential. If you, if you know about the demographics of Twitter, you know, Twitter has a disproportionate number of, of black users compared to the larger population um, and compared to other social media sites. And it often is, um, you know, black women who are invested both in racial justice projects and gender justice projects who are invested in these hashtags. Um, and so that's kind of how we then, you know, are like, obviously this book is about both things. Um, and should not be read as if like the chapters about gender about gender and the chapters about race or race. Hopefully they don't, they don't read that way um, because it's absolutely about both. Um, so if we have a few more minutes, I wanted to talk about allyship. Yeah. Um, so we have a whole chapter on allyship um, and, and the role that allies play um, in these uh, hashtags. And the punchline from that chapter is basically allies do a kind of bad job. <laughs> <laughs> allies try, uh, but they often make it worse, um, or, or at least uh, don't make things better. Um, so I would encourage you all to read that chapter. But 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 actually, there's a lovely example of allyship elsewhere in the book that I want to lift up. Um, so related to this um, issue of kind of intersectional violence against women. Um, you might recall this magazine cover um, uh, that featured the um, Bill Cosby's victims um, sitting in chairs and then one empty chair um, at the end. Uh, and uh, you know, to symbolize all the folks um, who had been assaulted, who couldn't for whatever reason come forward um, and be identified. Um, and we um, discovered uh, the hashtag, the empty chair, um, which um, Elon James White used uh, in order to highlight the stories of women who themselves couldn't come out um, to share their stories in an identified way, but who wanted to share their stories um, on Twitter in order to participate in this larger narrative about uh, violence against women. Um, so he um, used all the tools available on Twitter opened up his DMs, um, let women send him their stories, and then using his celebrity and his maleness, um, gave them cover um, in order to share those stories. So he spent a full 24 hours, um, almost consistently, sort of round the clock, the man did not sleep that day, um, tweeting out these stories so that women, women's stories could be heard, um, and yet they got to remain anonymous. Um, so I think that's a really lovely example. I'm wondering if you folks have uh, thoughts on that or, or ideas about how allies could do a better job. Well, I mean, yeah, we have good examples in the book of bad examples. Well, we, I think we have good examples of the book. We have examples that are like in some middling area, not bad or good, and maybe some that are like, eh. um, but that was a great example um, because we did um, in in the hashtags that we looked at that were related to, to to tweets about gendered violence and one of them was this hashtag the empty chair and again the data is what brought us this finding that we were really excited about of course you know I don't know about these two but I had assumed that like many of these other hashtags that the empty chair was a hashtag created by a woman to talk about you know why women you know don't come forward don't report want to stay anonymous etc in relation to to the conversation happening online around cosby and so then when we discovered you know i remember actually brooke showing me the data that this that elon james white was the first person to use this hashtag and i knew him because he's a comedian right he has a podcast it's called this week in blackness i don't know if he still has it but he did then sorry elon i'm not sure exactly what he's doing now but he ha you know and he was sort of like um you know, a fixture of black Twitter, but like a funny guy, right? Um, and he said, you know, a friend of his, I think it was a childhood friend or a college friend, had sent him a DM, a private DM that said, you know, Pete, I, I, I could have been in that empty chair. Like that cover of that thing reminds me of like me and all the people like me who we 
signed non-disclosure agreements in order to get some form of like what we thought maybe at the time was justice or we're still afraid of the repercussions of coming forward or whatever. And so, you know, he, it's really interesting because he actually reflected on it both as he was doing it and then years later when Me Too trended and everyone became familiar with Me Too, how overwhelmed he was. He just said, look, if you want to send me a DM of your story, I'll remove your identifying information. I'll screenshot it so it's your words, but I'll take, you know, your your Twitter handle and all that stuff off. And like Brooke said, I mean, he just, he did this and he, as he was doing it, was saying, you know, I'm getting so many of these messages. I can't keep up. This is overwhelming. Like, I can't believe. I mean, his affect in like playing that role was was pretty tangible, you know. Um, and years later, when Me Too trended, he gave this great interview saying that, you know, he basically has never been the same kind of since that moment. And and, you know, reflecting how far we have or haven't come since that moment. I, it was maybe three years before. Um, but yeah, that, that is a great example. What it's interesting because one of the other, um, allyship cases, and we have a contribution from Jason Ross. This is a really interesting case. So Jason Ross, um, you probably don't know who he is. It's fine. He's a, he's a television writer, so he's not like famous, but he did work for, I think the daily show with Jon Stewart and the night Jimmy Fallon's show. He, but he's a writer, a background guy. And, um, during the, um, you know, sort of rise and visibility of the hashtag Black Lives Matter and other related hashtags, particularly following um, the killings of Michael Brown and Eric Garner, which happened very close in timeline to each other. Um, you know, Jason Ross, he, you know, he writes he writes a little a blurb for us where he talks about how he just saw like white people didn't really know how to talk about this. Like it was easy for them to share the hashtags that black people were creating and talk about like, oh, police are doing this thing wrong, but that white people themselves weren't doing a lot of introspection about, you know, their experiences and their roles. And so he started this hashtag, hashtag criming while white. And his intention was kind of like, we need to talk about how as white people, we have interactions with the police all the time too, but like, they're fine. Like, they help us cross the street or, you know, they pull us over when we're like 16 and like send us home to mom or like, you know, like they don't draw a gun and shoot us like on uh, in in this way that that the black people are treated by police. And, you know, he you can tell I'll let you guys read the contribution. You have the book, but you can tell that he feels angsty about what it did or didn't accomplish. Right. Because one of the things, of course, that happened is the stories that people used to tell on it got sort of braggy you know like like there were like these tweets that were like yeah when I was 16 I got drunk and I stole my dad's shotgun and like I did like whatever whatever and then like the cop drove me home like ha 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 isn't that funny and it it sort of felt like you know and I think Jason knows that it kind of was like it got a little weird right um so you know we make some suggestions in the book (laughs) about how hashtags could be used more effectively by allies but i think elon did it without needing help so you know well and he did it like in response to the woman in his life who definitely gave a little direction to say this is this is something that i've experienced so i do think there's something about paying attention to the people who are most affected that really drove that hashtag success I got it. We got a time cue back there. Are we? You were we're fine. Okay. Yeah. You want us to start the Q and A? Okay. Okay. So there was a time cue. I was like, <laughs> I didn't imagine that we got a time cue. Um. Oh. Yeah. I well, I would love to hear from everybody who came out on a rainy day and are not obsessively checking the Super Tuesday results, uh, which I really again appreciate. Um. Free. Oh, and there's a mic in the back that Robin's holding, so. Although, honestly, for germ's sake, <laughs> I don't know that you want to use it. We can it. repeat your question if you want to just yeah, we'll repeat Yeah, we'll repeat your question. Hi. Um, hi, I, I wonder if you could... I, I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder how, how much some of the kind of repertoires that you identified were innovated by these groups or 
borrowed from other movements around the world, or was it still some iteration and borrowing and learning? And, and to, to, what, to what extent were, I'm thinking specifically of like putting names next to, to names and names next to places. Is, is, is that something that was kind of new to, you know, on, on Twitter at the time they were using it, or was, were, were people just had already been doing that kind of thing yeah. and then it took a, 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 a new trajectory? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll let Brooke speak to that too. But um, certainly there were hashtags being used for activism before and outside of the cases that we study, right? So we talk about how the um, 2011 um, uh, Iran election hashtag, and not 2011, that was 20, 2009? 2009, and then the 2011 Arab Spring, which come to be known as the Arab Springs, p- particularly Egyptian activists, were using hashtags and they were using actually Egyptian ash, ha, activists were using dates and place right so they were using like hashtag to hear square hashtag January 25th which was like the date that they occupied to hear square right so it, it, I wouldn't say that like these networks specifically invented co-occurrence or invented using place but we certainly see them perfect it right and we certainly see them use it more would you would you say I think that's right uh, uh, so what comes to mind for me is actually what the original work we did on the my NYPD hashtag. Um, I guess not surprisingly, but surprisingly to us at the time, we found um, sort of two different types of discourse would happen. So there, um, on one hand, was kind of outrage or um, uh, um, just like despair, right? So people sharing these stories um, and being horrified by them justifiably. Um, and then on the other side, snarkiness, right? So kind of poking fun, like, you know, need a massage? The NYPD's got you. And it's like, you know, someone being held down onto the ground. I think that's Jeannie's <laughs> tweet, <laughs> actually. Oh, hey. <laughs> Thanks, Jeannie. <laughs> um, and we found that the there were two Occupy handles. Um, Occupy... Um, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Bay Street um, that were really central and they were the two that were using both. Um, so so this strategy kind of leveraging um, emotion, different types of emotion. So on one hand, highlighting the outrage um, and the angst of these um, interactions. And then on the other hand, sort of making light of it and making it a little accessible for folks, um, I think really helps to build um, a broad coalition of folks, again, engaging with these kinds of hashtags, spreading them, and so on. So I think folks either explicitly or implicitly take cues from um, some of these organizations that now have emerged around online activism. But I do think the humor is unique to like black Twitter, like in some ways, you know what I mean? I mean, not that there aren't other people making snarky jokes, but the sort of way like those those jokes like the jokes of like images of like violence against black bodies with like jokes like hey the NYPD is here to help you do get your hair done and it's like a picture of a officer dragging like you know a black woman down the street with her hair like that kind of morbid ability to laugh at these like sort of forms of violent oppression to make them accessible like I don't remember seeing that in like you know, the Iran election hashtags or the Egyptian revolution hashtags, right? Like, so I think that the, the humor is perhaps one of the unique things in some of these um, cases. Not all, because I mean, some that it's hard to make any kind of humor out of, obviously. Um, but yeah, it also makes me think about the way that um, Janet mocks girls like us is unique because what I like about it is that it's self-referential. So it's girls like us as opposed to another conversation that might be uh, something that's like, that centers uh, cis women, right? So something like, we're girls too. That's not where she went with this. It's, it's about the lives and experiences of trans women. And so putting trans women at the center, I think is a very unique framing. Yeah. And one that uh, to me, anyway, really spoke to uh, the power and the, I don't know, just the cleverness of something and something so small that has really taken off and has been used in other places. So Girls Like Us, as a hashtag, also gets picked up in 
uh, a web series called Her Story that centers trans women that included uh, Angelica Ross, who's now on Pose, and from Pose is gone on to be an American horror story. So, and Angelica Ross, before she was famous or had any of that career, was one of the influencers in the Girls Like Us network when the hashtag first started being used. And so yes. some of these people like built connections through the hashtag and now like she has a whole career. Yes. Yeah. And and interestingly enough, building on that, it was through Girls Like Us that Angelica Ross met uh Another actress, Jamie Clayton, who was also in her story, and the two of them were roommates and then started working on the project Her Story. So it's amazing to see what kind of community can be built through the hashtag and what wonderful things that we've been able to see as a result as we've seen trans women in media much more much more visibly than we've ever seen in the past. I have a question about, um, well, first, thank you for your work. Um, and your intention to focus on individuals, I'm curious about that, and also sort of the originator of the hashtag, for example, is like, is that part of your methodology, or is that something that is integral to the idea of an activism that's centered around, centered around a person while also centered around a community. And how does the individual play a role in the new realm of activist movement building when one can say that communities are about the group, but this is, seems to be about the person. And I don't have an opinion one way or the other, but I'm just noticing that there's a lot of, again, your table of content, or in your index, it's like a list of names of people, right? So, so what does that mean for you, and why is that important to this project? I love this question as a social movements person because I'm like, no, the book is not about individuals. Like, I super am like, oh, no. Um, look, we're telling you stories. We didn't we didn't build the index. Somebody went through the book and, like, took, you know, built the index first. But <laughs> we're, we're, we're telling you stories that are anecdotes through, you know, individual people's stories. And we do have people's stories partially and this is actually something we're very proud of about this book because the three of us are we're academics and and we aren't only academics we also have connections to activist communities and creative communities and other things but historically with twitter research um there had been this trend of sort of um of vulturism where researchers kind of swooped in they weren't familiar with the communities they were studying. They just collected a lot of like big data. They did analysis. They like reported back. And I've actually seen some really sort of egregious and I have examples I can tell people later of like where they completely misunderstand the community or the hashtag or whatever. So one of the things we did do that's like individualistic is we felt if we were going to write this book, I mean, yes, we also were in these networks. Part of why we started studying this is because we were in racial justice networks. We were in um, gender justice networks, but also we wanted the ordinary people who, and we're talking mass, again, masses of ordinary people, millions of people, for example, um, within the first week have used the hashtag Ferguson. And obviously we don't name every one of those people in the book. That would be the whole book, right? Um, but we wanted to make sure that the, the people had um, a voice in what we were doing. And so that's why we have contributions in each chapter it's why we had genie write the forward you know it's why we have people sort of reflect and it's they're not all creators some of them are people who created the hashtag some of them um are people who are part of so we have a, a black lives matter organizer who has like a little blurb in it for us as well um and part of why we did that was it was sort of for us part of the ethical framework of our research was just that we wanted to make sure um that we weren't doing that thing where we came in and like sort of took credit and told other people's stories and didn't let them sort of speak back to what we were saying that we found. Um, so that's part of why we have the individual people um, in there. I'd add that one of the things that we did also to address that ethical question was to go through, find all of the handles that we used and talked about in the book and actually reach out to people and let them know, hey, we're gonna use your hashtag in this, or we're gonna use this tweet that you created 
how do you feel about that? And even when I was doing my initial work on hashtag girls like us, I had some relationship with Janet Mock on Twitter and so asked, you know, I'm researching this. How do you feel about that? What are you interested in in terms of this hashtag? Because so often academics get what they want and the community doesn't get what they need. That was a big one for the the gendered violence um, tweets as well because like there are people who have sent tweets about being victims of sexual assault or about whatever and you know to be quite frank many journalists and academics attitude is well Twitter's public and they screenshot someone's tweet and they like put it in a Washington Post article and suddenly that person who only has, you know, 300 followers on Twitter has like 20,000 people see their tweet and they start getting trolled and they start getting attacked and they start getting, you know, whatever. So that's part of why we did that. And so we did actually, when people had gone back and deleted their tweets or when people said, no, you can't use my tweet, we didn't. Um, which I, probably doesn't sound wild, but I would say in, in among people who do this type of research, like people are like, oh. You talk to them? yeah yeah i mean i don't want to bore you with the methods i'm like data geek out of the three of us so i'm the one writing python scripts to scrape out tweets and etc um uh but i i do want to lift up that um a little bit of what you're seeing um the stories are kind of a sleight of hand uh for a much broader community right so so the reason that certain tweets or certain stories uh, appear in the book is because they've been selected not by us but by the community of people using those hashtags as being particularly important. Um, so I'm happy to unpack the actual way we do that and determine that um, if you're interested. But but to say that each one of these is representative of hundreds or thousands or in some cases millions of people saying I have surveyed the stories available on this hashtag and that's the one I think is important. Yeah. That's the one I want people to see. Yeah, I mean, I was thankful for this method and, and, and Brooke in part, you know, Brooke brought us part of the methods for the book, which is that, look, when you're dealing with millions of people and millions of tweets and you want to tell a story, one question for us was, well, which story is most compelling? And so this method allowed us to say, oh, look, like this person sent a tweet with the hashtag, you okay, sis, and they have 300 followers and like five people liked it and no one retweeted it. But this person sent a hashtag, uh, a tweet with hashtag you okay sis, and they also have 300 followers, but 20,000 people, you know, liked it and 10,000 people retweeted it. What did that person say that was more compelling, that was more persuasive, that picked up? Like what happened that made that version of or that use of the hashtag compelling to the community? So as Brooke said, part of what you're seeing is we did find those individual people but we found them through the collective response of the other people to what they were saying yes you commented on twitter and like how you feel about them as a company mm -hmm. uh, how during your uh, during your method, like the execution of your methods, how did you find Twitter just implicitly either allowing you to collect this data easily or having to find ways around that? So this is a really interesting question because we could not have written this book now. So one of the th one of the benefits of being at Northeastern was we have a colleague, Alan Mislov, who had started just collecting all of this Twitter data. And because of his work, Twitter started to pay attention to scholars who wanted to collect Twitter data. So then they started to create uh, amounts of information, Twitter data that people could access, that scholars could access. So I don't know if, Brooke, you wanna say something about like the fire hose and the, <laughs> the so, different. <laughs> sure, so. Um during the course of time where we were writing this book, Twitter dialed down researcher access um, from potentially 100% with some tricks uh, to 10% to 1% of the overall Twitter feed. Um, and just to give you a scope of what they're doing, uh, they sell data. Um, so researchers can buy data. In a subsequent project, uh, I needed to buy 
one, no, 17 hours worth of Me Too tweets. There was, for reasons, I needed them. Um, it cost me $1,450 <laughs> for 17 hours of tweets. Uh, so, so they effectively rendered academic research impossible, right? So, so even, even Ann Burke doesn't have that kind of money. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So that's really, it's really problematic. So, so a, a lot of what's going on on Twitter right now, for example, election uh, coverage might be of interest. Um, Twitter can do research on it. They can tell us what they think is, you know, they can promise us that there's no foreign interference, uh, but there is no check on that. There's no way to do the research to check um, to see what's going on. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things it's really, I don't want to say it's lucky, but maybe um, auspicious that we started doing this research when we started doing it and collecting the data when we started doing it, because as Moya said, and as Brooke just said, like, if we wanted to do this now, we couldn't afford to get the data. Um, we wouldn't have access to the data. Um, and that's just one of the sort of, we have a afterword in the book where we talk about some of our concerns, not only about Twitter, but, you know, in general about social media, about data collection, about procedures. I mean, one thing that we talk about in the book also is that, I um, can't remember if it's in the conclusion or the afterword, but, you know, many of these folks who are the creators that I mentioned who, you know, created these tweets that built the networks to make Me Too possible, that built the networks to make, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter possible, um, are also victims of horrendous harassment on Twitter. Um, they also, you know, often when they tweet these things are faced with not just people that disagree with them politically, which is fine. We actually found a case in the Baltimore case where people disagreed politically and they were talking about it and it was fine. But people, you know, um, w women getting rape threats, people getting death threats, people being called racial slurs, you know, and and, you know, in part, this is a question not just on on Twitter, but on social media in general, where social media companies have really failed to um, develop um efficient ways of managing abuse and harassment online um and i keep picking on genie because genie's here but like we saw a case like that happen to genie so genie is this person who you know organically becomes really important in several of these networks uh that we study and of course it makes people upset and angry who don't want people talking about these issues right and something called brigading happens where um you know, Twitter has this thing built in. It's a it's a it's an algorithm where if if someone's tweets are reported as offensive often enough, you know, so I go in and I report, you know, your tweets is offensive. Maybe one report it's not a big deal. You you keep your Twitter account, but if you know a hundred people or a thousand people report your tweets as offensive, um, your account will be suspended until it can be further reviewed. And so, of course, this was theoretically designed to protect people from harassment so that, or from to, to stop people from, you know, tweeting offensive, problematic things. But as we know from the last several years, there are lots of Nazis on Twitter and, and, you know, other sort of bad actors tweeting things that aren't real, things that are offensive. Um, but these people figured out that they could use that algorithm because it's not a real person, right? to then go to somebody like an activist or an ordinary person who's speaking out, a woman who's speaking out about assault, um, a black person who's speaking out about racism, and they could collectively organize and report that person's tweet and get that person kicked off Twitter, right? And so that method that was supposed to protect people theoretically becomes weaponized against those people. And those are some of the like sort of infrastructural things that we have critiques of you know, the company around and, and not again, it's not just Twitter. Facebook has the same problem. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, we we did see that happen in in several cases. You were what, off Twitter for like eight months or something. And didn't the ACLU have to get involved to get you your Twitter account back? Yeah, because I'm a little um, I like overdo things. So I was like, how do I sue them? And somebody was like, well, slow down. <laughs> I was you that like you're not strong enough to box with the gods, but um, maybe we can help you. And so and it was all back channeling, and I just just because the networks that I made through all of the you know previous yeah hashtags and everything, I was like, well, we know somebody who knows somebody who can who's working. Who can talk to someone at Twitter? Yeah, and then they invited you yeah. out. And then they invited me to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot about Twitter. There's a lot to say about it. And again, probably a whole other book, but we, we tried to say some of it in this one. <laughs> question about the analysis specifically. What I'm trying to drive at is, I'm a poet, so I care a lot about language. And one of the things that Sarah talked about was that you can have two people who both have 300 followers and use the exact same hashtag. One person has 20,000 retweets, the other person has five. And so it seems to me that something fundamentally is happening at the level of language yep. and form, like mastery of the form itself mm -hmm. in order to galvanize and get people interested in topics. What is the analysis leading out from that? Yeah, well, I mean, so we use two types of methods, and so now we're going to get kind of wonky, if you guys don't mind. <laughs> so Brooke brought us sort of like the big data network analysis where we can take millions of tweets and crunch them and see like who's getting the most retweets, who's getting like, you know, whatever. And then we did critical qualitative discourse analysis. Um, you might have heard it called rhetorical analysis. You might have heard it called narrative analysis, depending on your field. Um, but if you're a poet or a creative writer, I mean, it's exactly what you're talking about. We took then you know, from the millions of tweets, we took then the ones that through the sort of mathematical method we found to be the most popular, the most whatever, and we said, okay, what are they saying? What are they saying that's different? What are they saying that's specific? Are they making people laugh? Are they um, making people cry? Are they um, just really using language in this efficient way? And in fact, that is exactly, you know, what we found, and we, we, we show a lot of examples of this in the book um, where... Um, what people are saying and how they are saying it. And I love that you said you're a poet because I'm like, you know, we obviously didn't look at it through that lens, but it's a, it's a kind of a form of poetry, right? Um, absolutely. To be able to, in 140 characters, at least it was 140 for most of our data before Twitter upped it to the 250, make a political argument that millions of strangers will engage with or thousands of strangers will engage with or that will spread, right? And, um... A really good example of this is um, we go back and we trace, we find the first most circulated tweet in the hashtag Ferguson network. So a lot of people are like, you know, researchers have done this method where they're like, what are the most popular people? What are the most popular accounts? Well, if you do that, it's going to be, you know, celebrities, journalists, um, you know, CNN, whatever, because they already started with, 200 million followers or whatever on Twitter. So of course, if they tweet something, they get more views. But Brooke was able to disaggregate that down to, okay, let's go to the first day. Let's go to within four hours when Michael Brown was shot, right? And left on the street, right? Um, there weren't any journalists there. CNN wasn't there. There weren't any celebrities. Nobody knew about it. What was the tweet that helped this story circulate? Because why, I mean... You know, Eric Garner had been killed here in New York j just recently before. You know, so people always ask us this question. Why was it Ferguson that seemed to be the one that that blew up? And, you know, we find a young woman again, you know, who's a neighbor of Michael's Brown's who steps out on her front doorstep and takes a picture that you have probably seen if you're on Twitter, which was a picture of Darren Wilson still standing over Michael Brown's body. Um, and she sends this tweet that it's not you know, by conventional means, you know, um, she, eloquent or fancy, but it's a tweet that says SMH, which, you know, is like online shorthand for shaking my head. Uh, Ferguson police just killed a 17, executed, just uses the word executed, just executed a 17 year old boy walking home from the store. Hashtag Ferguson. And that's the first tweet with the hashtag Ferguson that actually becomes influential in the network. That's the one that gets to the alderman, Antonio French, that gets to the local celebrity, Tefpo. I realized from doing this work that most people don't know who Tefpo is. He's kind of like only if you're from a certain area and if you're into underground hip hop, right? But, um, and what did she say? I mean, that SMH at the beginning of that hashtag right if we're gonna re get really microscopic about it that kind of familiarity it's like sadness but it's also like not surprise it's just the shaking my head and she uses the word executed not shot not killed 
She calls him a boy, which was really important, right? Because the framing in the media is always that these are big, scary men, right? And so there's a lot of complex things going on in that tweet, right? Yeah, and that also makes me think about the way that people craft the hashtags themselves because part of this is also about what is it that is going to make people pay attention? So as we discussed, we have the names of people. So people are learning the names of who has been killed, the places. People are learning where this happened, but then also using it in other contexts. But I think there's some magic in the length of these hashtags and the kinds of arrangements of the words. Because there are things that are similar that just don't move in the same way. And we can see this also in what hashtags get picked up and what hashtags are not successful. So you might notice too that now that companies see that hashtags are working, they have tried to get into this game as well, but they're never as successful as individuals who come up with hashtags. So hashtags that come from corporations tend to be longer, they tend to have you know, every word spelled out. <laughs> it doesn't work the same way. And, and they reek of inauthenticity, right? Exactly. Which is part of why these like organic folks who are just coming up with a hashtag and, and a tweet, part of why people retweet them, part of why people like what they're saying is because it reads as authentic. Like you're seeing this picture that she just stepped out on her front doorstep and took, mm-hmm. right? And so the way that people in this digital space are ju- judging expertise and le- and authenticity is almost, is, is different, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that, I think that has a lot to do with which stories become popular and which ones don't. Definitely. Did you notice a, Jeannie, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Did you notice it becoming like easier once sort of changed the, way retweets happened because remember like it was the manual retweet and then there was the the auto retweet basically Mm -hmm. kind of two different behaviors happening there so for those folks that didn't hear Jeannie's quiet she asked if we saw a difference in how things spread when Twitter was actually changing the infrastructure of like how to share and we retweet tweets that was a tongue twister Mm -hmm. um so I think yes. I think uh, you know it's hard to disentangle causality, right? So so as time moves on, the hashtags um, that become popular become more popular. And there's uh, without boring you with the mathematical details, there's a few different ways to measure popularity in these networks. So one is a lot of retweets. One is sort of retweeting between people who don't normally talk to each other, right? Um, and there's a few other ways, right? Um, and we see all of those things becoming amplified. Uh, At the same time, we also see a lot more hijacking, a lot more resistance, a lot more trolling behaviors, right? So for everything that's good about changing the infrastructure of Twitter, we also get a kind of complementary badness. Um, So early on, the networks uh, were a little bit more pure, a little bit more discursively focused on the same thing. And then later on, it's harder to stay focused. Um, People have to work a lot harder to exclude certain kinds of messages and include others. Yeah, I'd add too that one of the things we noticed also was the change in when the images attached to a tweet were readily shown versus before when you had to click the link to see the picture that that also changed how people, it changed how things got retweeted and also the popularity of certain tweets. So I do think that there's, as Twitter itself evolved, we see different ways and different uh, resonances Mm -hmm. of these hashtags. Yeah, I was just gonna give you a related example to that. So the the first sort of, hashtag that we look at we go back you know pre hashtag black lives matter pre the Trayvon Martin case and we look at the hashtag Oscar Grant which you know Oscar Grant was killed in 2009 and people did use Twitter in you know response to that but like hardly I mean one not a lot of I shouldn't say hardly anyone were on Twitter but Twitter was different infrastructurally so if you recall the Oscar Grant case Oscar Grant was killed on New Year's Eve by a BART police officer in Oakland and it was filmed on a cell phone camera 
But in 2009, Twitter didn't have the infrastructure to upload video. So you couldn't share that video of Oscar Grant being killed on Twitter, right? Which we very much know later, there were cases where you could. And so what happened was people would tweet about the Oscar Grant case and they'd have to provide an outlink to YouTube, which at the time YouTube was like the only kind of like social media site where you could upload your own videos, right? So you would have to follow out links to get to some of these things. And so we absolutely see, and we argue in the book that, you know, again, this question of why was it this case that trended? Why was it this? Like it both has to do with the importance of the stories people are telling, but it often also has to do with like what shifted between the Oscar Grant case and the Trayvon Martin case. One of the things that shifted was the ability for people to upload video and for people to upload images and have them auto display in your feed, whether frankly you wanted to see them or not, because there's a, you know, there's some questions here about whether we actually think these images we want to see them or if it's useful for people to see them. Right. But, um, of course the things that have images and video get more attention because that's just how the brain works. Right. Um, Okay, well, then, oh, oh, oh look, Gaia, yeah. we got no, one more question. Um, I didn't think it was worthy of the last question. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's um, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear what the three of you say to people who maybe, uh, like, dismiss, like, online activism, you know, and like, who kind of even use it as, like, oh, why don't you do something about it? And people are like, well, we are, you know. Like, in addition, but anyways, I'm just curious to hear some reflection on it. I mean, come on. That's a great last question. Yeah, that's a that's a great last question. That's a great last question. And I mean, look, people don't know. Maybe they're not aware that I'll just give one example. Alicia Garza, who was the first person to use the hashtag Black Lives Matter on Facebook before it tr uh, migrated over to, to Twitter, um, is a lifelong organizer, <laughs> right? Like she's doing the work and has been doing the work in her community around justice issues for her whole adult life, right? And so one thing is that this idea that just because people are engaging in activism online must mean, and this was, there was a lot of writing about this both in academic and journalistic spaces. Malcolm Gladwell famously wrote this piece called um, The Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted and it ironically came out like two months before the Arab Spring happened. <laughs> and then everyone was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> But, but like what we know is that people are doing both, right? Um, people are doing both and can do both. And that there are some people, and anybody who's been part of a social movement knows this, there are some people that either because of a, uh, perhaps a disability, they can't come to a march, right? Or there are just some people that like, that's not their thing, but they can share something online. And so the idea, like people who are gonna come to a march, people are, that are gonna you know, show up and put their bodies on the line, people that are gonna blockade a highway, like those people are gonna do that whether or not we're tweeting about it. They were doing it before Twitter existed and they'll do it after Twitter doesn't exist, right? But more of us might find out about it and it might get more traction and it might get more attention from journalists and elites and other people in power because bigger and bigger and bigger networks are sharing what they're doing. So that's, I mean, I don't know what these guys think. That's, that's the answer I always tell my students is like, come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I definitely think of Twitter as a tool. So Twitter is a tool as hashtags are a tool. And so there are things that social media users and social justice activists use to create conversation and actually move, uh, our movements forward. But as a tool, it's imperfect. You know, you use it when it's useful and sometimes it's not. And I am just, one, amazed at the way that people have been able to reimagine what Twitter can be through hashtags and through the activism that they've paired with on the ground organizing uh, and what they've been able to move forward. and. You know, as somebody who also attends the Allied Media Conference, mm -hmm. I think we see that media can be so many different things and that people are not wanting for different tools to use. I think this 
book is exciting because we show how this one tool has been so effective in all of these different ways. But I'm excited to see what the next tools are. I mean, I, I've seen, I'm too old for TikTok. I just have like <laughs> decided that that's not gonna be me. That's not my ministry, but I really appreciate how young people are using it. And I see TikTok being some new way to have a conversation that Twitter doesn't imagine. And it's interesting also to see the demographics of these tools change. Because when we were using, we were aging up in terms of people who are using Twitter. And there's a younger generation that's like Twitter is for old people. <laughs> so, I mean, there's different tools that I think are gonna be utilized. And I'm excited to see where that takes us. My students told me the other day I like used Facebook as an example. And one of my students literally said, None of us are on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. Uh, it's all right. Uh, when people ask me this question, uh, I like to uh, remind people of the, the kind of potency and importance of shared af affect, right? So, so what's the point of activism? Arguably, at least one of the points is to create coalitions of outrage or to create coalitions of hope, um, to create coalitions of calls for justice. Um, and Twitter is incredibly effective at that. So, so not only bringing together the folks who are sort of already on board, who are already in that space where they're sharing that feeling, but to bring new people on board and to bring them on board um, in lightweight ways and in, in more targeted ways, right? So to call people into a movement, uh, to call people in for help. And I don't think we should underestimate the power of those emotions, right? So when society, or at least groups within society, are all on the same page with some kind of feeling, that's where action comes from, right? Um, so, so the slipperiness between these emotions and the offline action um, is really powerful. And I think uh, we're just only starting to see that kind of impact. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all on behalf of The Strand for coming. We just need a moment to set up for the signing and then we will get started. But the line for that is gonna start where Moya is sitting and then sort of wrap around this way. Um, and yeah, thank you so much again. <laughs>